Shopify presents cool sheets from aha to I suffered from the wrong kind of hot in bed, heat induced insomnia. That was my aha moment. Bed sheets that keep you cool. Then I thought, how do I even sell bed sheets? That's when I had the idea that made it all possible. Signing up on Shopify. This is Possibility, powered by Shopify. Sign up for a free trial at shopify.com slash offer 22. Shopify.com slash offer 22. This episode is brought to you by 1923 on Paramount+. Plus. In Taylor Sheridan's new original series, 1923, the Duttons confront challenges, including the end of the First World War, America's industrialization, and the start of the Great Depression. Helen Mirren and Harrison Ford star in the new original series, 1923, Streaming December 18th exclusively on Paramount Plus. Head to ParamountPlus.com to try it free. Coming up on the payoff, Courtney Friel spent six years working at Fox News Channel before becoming an anchor at KTLA in Los Angeles. But it's the more than 11 years of sobriety that she likes to talk about the most. She's also pretty open about her 15 years before she got sober, including cocaine fueled days in college and living fast in New York City while at Fox News. Her book, Tonight at 10, Kicking Booze and Breaking News, details all this in great depth and is actually slated to become a feature film. She also had a pretty cool podcast called Keeping It Freel. That was before COVID shut down the studio, though. Looking for more of that in the future. Looking forward to an hour of Courtney coming up. Did I mention she's from Philly? But first, Kevin Souza. <laughs> The ocean floor. Hello. Courtney. Pete. You got it. I'm guessing. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> you better hope it's me, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, I didn't know if you had an assistant. <laughs> no, I do not have an assistant. I got a producer. Uh, Mike is here. Um, Hi, Mike. The book is called Tonight at 10, Kicking Booze and Breaking News. Courtney Friel, thank you so much for, for taking the time to join us today. It, it nice means a lot. to meet you over the phone. Well, you're, you're a Philly girl from, from Audubon. I'm from right outside Philly, like Villanova. So it's kind of like I was talking to the guy, Mike here, the producer, and I told him that I reached out to you. And I said, she's from Philly. He goes, you guys have a weird thing about that, people from Philly. I'm kind of jealous that you hung on to your six foot area. Did you like that? <laughs> yes, yes. I mean, but it's been so long since I've lived there. Well, we're going to go since backwards. School, we're going to go backwards and we're going to take you there. But I want to start off <laughs> with your sobriety date. It's a very cool one that I don't want to mess up that I did not plan because some people do plan these things out. Oh, nine, oh, nine, oh, nine. And this wasn't planned. How cool is that? It wasn't. I mean, I checked into rehab on September 8th and they were like, okay, so your sobriety date will be this. I'm like, whoa, that's pretty cool. So were you drunk or were you like on, on drugs when you checked into rehab? I, I was. Um, it w Well, it wasn't that bad because I pretty much decided I would go in Florida and during my little intervention with seven people surrounding my bed. And then I had like one last drink, which was horrible. It was like a raspberry vodka with seven up. And I remember thinking like, this is the worst last drink. But then I flew back. To New York to go to rehab there but I took like some Xanax and Adderall just for kicks like on the way there because I knew it was gonna be <laughs> over after that whatever gets you there that's what somebody told me once I showed up I was a mess um when's when was the first time you drank I was 15 and my other friends had all started at 14 and I was like Christian good girl no I'm not doing that <laughs> <laughs> but then I hung out with like two guys and they were drinking beer and I guess I want, I mean, and I hated the taste of beer too. So, but I got drunk super fast and of course I ended up going home and throwing up in the tub and trying to cover it up. I did a bad job. My mom was like, okay, you're grounded. <laughs> but for me, it was, it was being able to escape my feelings of like being bullied and not being liked and also I had been really shy so I just came out of my shell and became this like fun and funny person and then I suddenly had all these party friends so I was like 
you know, in a group of people that, that wanted to be with me. And it was, I mean, it was great. I mean, I think that's what so many alcoholics start drinking for is to deal with social anxiety or to numb stuff out. <laughs> Those are like the two main reasons for drinking, right? I thought, yeah, I thought so. I, I, I'm Looking back, I kind of felt like something was wrong with me because I was so shy and scared. I always say when I was going to the dances in eighth grade, I was terrified. And then I started to drink in ninth grade and I, and I could not wait to get there. And it's funny now that we're like in very outgoing, extroverted careers like news, which I wanted to do back then, but I was so shy. <laughs> so it's kind of weird how that turned out. But I, it's weird because alcohol, like I'm the person today that alcohol made me be, but without the alcohol, if that makes sense. Like I can completely be that like super, you know, like no filter outgoing person. Um, and obviously could do that sober. Well, that's what makes you a super attractive, sober person. Like I, I was watching some of your stuff and you mentioned people think it's not going to be fun if I get sober. It, it is fun. It's just, a, it's a different kind of fun. It, look, it takes a while. Like anyone who might be considering getting sober or is in the beginning of sober, uh, trials, like it sucks in the beginning. It really, really does. I mean, it feels like Groundhog's Day because you're not used to being so present with yourself and the days seem like they're like a hundred hours long and you're like, Oh, I'm bored. What do I do with myself? Like I already went to the gym. Like how much TV can I watch? I mean, that is completely normal if you are, are in that. But like, if you just keep like listening to what people in the programs are, are saying about how your definition of fun changes, like I remember hearing that. And then it's so true. Like, I mean, I just want to, like, go – I can't wait till the spas open back up here in L.A. Like, that's my just my idea of, like, going to a bar on a Friday night. It's like, no, I want to, like, go to the Korean spa with my girlfriend. <laughs> like, I used to hate when people – I hated massages. Like, I remember I went to a bachelorette party, and, like, I just wanted to drink. And they're like, no, we're getting, like, massages. And I was like, oh, that's so stupid. I don't want people touching me. Like, I just want to freaking take shots. And now, like – being getting a massage is like the most amazing thing ever. Yeah, you're literally very so comfortable very in your own you skin. Change. You do like, but but it's like evolving in a good way. You can like use all those new hours to do self help on yourself, to take a Spanish class, to start painting, to to go travel and actually take in the moments and culture, and not you know when I used to travel, I'd just be like drunk the whole time and hungover and in bed and hating myself and not seeing anything. The first, the first time you drank, you were 15. Uh, mm -hmm. You were kind of a force of nature in high school. How did drinking affect your your day to day? Like when you started to drink, did you notice you were that person who was going to drink every weekend or? My parents were really strict. So it, it through high school, it could only be a weekend thing. It was like going out to my friend's houses like we you know philly it was like bonfires and like my friend had a barn so her parents just let us all like have parties in the barn so i would just stay there on weekend nights and and drink i mean i i looked forward to the weekend partying for sure but i also knew way early on that i wanted to work in tv news so i like during the week nights like lived in the tv studio until 10 o'clock at night at school because I just was constantly working on all of my little projects for the t for you know our TV channel that our school had, but that's where I developed the work hard, play hard mentality too. <laughs> did you find that you were like kind of sinking yourself? Looking back now, right, with the knowledge you have, did you find that you were throwing yourself either into work or social, and social included the drinking now? My whole fifteen year party career, my job and partying were the most important things to me. So drinking never got in the way of me doing my news stuff. I mean, towards the end, obviously it was, it was definitely affecting me, but like I was very dedicated to getting the TV stuff done first and then going out and raging. And when I went to college, that's where things of course stepped up as it does for so many people, because 
you're not living with your parents. So we would drink every single night and find a reason to drink like, Oh, it's the new moon tonight. And uh, then I'll, I also did a ton of ecstasy and that's when I started doing cocaine. And so all this in college. I mean, oh yeah. 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 I mean, so I moved out to LA. I did my first year of school in North Carolina. Where'd you go to North Carolina? I went to a smaller school called Elon. Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. And um, that's where, you know, we did tons of ecstasy and I was starting to dabble in Coke and my roommate from there, we ended up moving out to LA in um, 99 and like we needed to have like a, a job too. So we walked down to the tanning salon right on the corner and turns out that guy was like a major coke dealer our boss and so that entire year i did coke every single day i mean i would do it and i was going to santa monica city college just to get my residency there and i would do it in the bathroom like in between studying in the library or in between class and i my roommate you know she'd give me a line to wake up and we'd be up. I mean, we just got free coke the entire year. I, I would do coke and I'd do lines and then jump in a tanning bed. Like I don't even know how I. Like, was there were there right? any consequences? So I, was, I was extremely skinny and very tan, or yeah, skinny and tan and looked horrible. No, well, the I mean, here's the, the sad part of the matter is that that was the only year in college that I got straight A's. Oh, great. So. I mean, I was like a B plus student, like always, you know, I always say I'm, I'm more street smart than book smart, but I mean, I, I did well, but like really like the cocaine helps me get straight A's. <laughs> so, I mean, that, and then later on, you know, when I didn't have my cocaine, I would snort my Adderall. So that's what kids are doing these days, all the Adderall. I mean, it's basically like cocaine in a pill, right? It's amazing. I, I always, that was the first time I ever felt any change chemically was when I was a kid and I was taking uh, Ritalin. And I remember being like, oh, man, I'm turned on now. I, I'm, effect, I'm effective. Uh, yeah. I mean, that's probably what I miss the most in sobriety. Like, I don't really miss anything. But every every now and then it's like, oh, it'd be, it'd be nice to have an Adderall. But, that, you know, my, my, my five drugs of choice were alcohol, cocaine. Um, Adderall, Ambien, and Xanax. So all of those things, you know, I can't have now. And I, and I haven't had for 11 and a half years. It's been 11 and a half years. 11 and a half years. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you're coming up on 10, right? I'm coming up on 10. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, November 7th, 2011. So I'm 11, 7, 11. You're 09, 09, 09. <laughs> yes. You're in, so you're in LA, right? And you're working at the mm-hmm. tanning salon. You're doing a lot of blow. And when did right. you work? Oh for- yeah, so I ended up at the I ended up at the end of the year going to the hospital, thinking that I was having a heart attack, which turned out to just be like really bad acid reflux from all the crappy vodka and diet cokes that I had drank that whole year. <laughs> An extreme paranoia, probably too. Yeah, and I and of course I didn't tell them that that's what I was. I'm sure I'm sure like I'm sure now they were like, oh, this girl's hot, super high. Um, and I told myself I wasn't ever going to do it again. So a year and a half went by without cocaine. And it's the thing, the, the, the progression of alcoholism and addiction, it's, it's like the train that just keeps on, on moving. Like they say your disease is doing push-ups in the parking lot. And that's why so many people overdose after they have tried to get sober because it, it just, it just, doesn't like it's not like it lets it's not like and, and that's why you have to keep playing the tape and reminding yourself like this is how it gets there's no such thing as one drink I can't drink like a normal person because I will the moment alcohol touches my lips I will immediately want cocaine and I will be like up all night and I'll be like you know uh, like with alcohol for me it was just like I was I'd end up crying or I'd end up in a fight or I'd end up disappearing or end up puking or passing out. Like nothing good came from it ever. <laughs> How about uh, Channel One? Because I, I was a kid. You and they, Channel you, One in they, your school? Yes, at Archbishop Carroll. So I, I know that you were on there. And you did. were you in Philly and then you got the opportunity to go to Channel One or were you already in L.A.? Yeah, no, no, no. That was I was a sophomore or was that junior? I can't remember. I was sixteen when I went there. So I think it was my junior year when I got picked for that. And so that was I was still like 
you know, I was still in work mode under like my parents' roof and everything. So it was not like we were drinking there or anything. Okay. And that was, that was very exciting to get that call that I had been picked for that. Yeah. For people who don't know, Channel One was like a who's who of who's going to make it in the news industry. It was like a well, lot. I would say it was the Mickey Mouse Club for journalists. So like Anderson Cooper and Lisa Ling and Marie Menounos. Uh, they're just some of the, the bigger names from there. So that had to be a huge assist for you. You're working at the tanning salon and you're going to school. Do you still want to, do you still have that goal of being a journalist? Oh my gosh. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. And, and even while I was working at the tanning salon doing Coke, I was also in, interning at MTV. And then, then I got an opportunity to be like a little, uh, digital journalist or like kind of like a one man band for Oprah had just launched the own channel for, and so it was a show on there. And I did that for like a year and a half while I was in college. I would shoot stories and they would air. Um, I mean, I I was always working towards um, becoming a news anchor. Like I was obsessed with that. So luckily, like, thank God, like my addiction didn't like spiral too out of control that I couldn't do that. But look, look how many functioning alcoholics and addicts there are out there. I mean, in every profession where there's success, whether you're a doctor or cop or professor, I mean, there, it doesn't discriminate. There are successful functioning alcoholics everywhere. And that's why like, you know, initially I thought, Oh, an alcoholic is like a, a person who beats their wife wife and lives on the street and doesn't pay their rent and doesn't have a job like the bum you know that but that's not the case at all did you ever get in any big trouble uh when you were younger going through this that was brought on by alcohol or drugs i mean i had a federale knock on my car door in tijuana when i was doing coke in broad daylight off a cd and he's like uh you need to pay me two hundred dollars to get out of this. So we went to the ATM and I gave him the money. And then I asked, I actually had the balls to ask him if I could get the drugs back. And he gave it to me. No, he didn't. Yeah. And then I went back across the border to a party in San Diego. I was like, y'all, this is really expensive blow tonight. <laughs> so you were constantly, do you notice that too, looking back, right? Because that's what the addict does. Like these are, there are these, doors you walk through or stop signs you blow through. I mean, that's, that's like normal people don't do that. I'm so grateful that I did not have any big legal repercussions. Like I'd never had a DUI. Um, and thank God I never overdosed because right around the time I was getting sober, that's when Heath Ledger and DJ AM died. And I was like, Oh my gosh, you know, I'm going to, that's going to happen to me. Like I have five things in my system too. Like I'm just not going to wake up one day. And at that point I just like, I didn't even care. I think I was so like depressed because of course alcohol is a depressant. So people who are depressed really shouldn't be drinking because (laughs) it's just depressing them even more. Um, But also like when I was working at Fox News in New York, and that's when I got sober in 2009, I was starting to get really concerned that I was going to get arrested for buying drugs from like some shady dealer. Cause I would just have like shady drug dealers show up wherever I was all the time. And then sure enough, like probably like eight years later or something, I read an article about a Fox news producer who got caught up in like, I guess they were, they were doing a big takedown of some drug guy in New York city and she had only bought like two eight balls from him. And there were all these people in like high executive level things that were named for having bought Coke like once or twice from some guy. And of course they got fired. And so like that wasn't that far off from me be, having being concerned about that. So I'm so grateful that that didn't happen. And, and Fox was super cool about me going to rehab and everything. I, I think they, they appreciate people who, want to do something before like having a big scandal and having to go to <laughs> yeah. rehab. What got you to rehab? You, you're obviously like, that's it's getting pretty crazy, right? The tanning salon job. Is, right. I mean, it sounds awesome, but of course it's big time trouble. Uh, and then well, remember the tanning, but the tanning salon job was 10, 10 full years earlier. So, I mean, I, I had had like 
instances where, like, I almost got fired from World Poker Tour when I was hosting that. What happened there? Um, well, so my very first night shooting, um, I hung out with, I, like, I met, I was, like, partying after because it was in Vegas and, like, ran into the crew in the cafeteria area of the Bellagio because we had asked access to that. And, like, was eating with them at, like, 4 a.m. and, like, completely passed out into a plate of spaghetti and my dress was falling off and stuff. And since that was, that was my first night, like with the crew, like they told on me. And so the head of the show called my agent and was like, do we have a problem here? And I was like, no, oh my gosh. So I, I quit for like nine months, um, just like cold turkey doing everything. Cause I was so scared about that. Did anybody then, tell like, you to quit? Like, like you, did anybody say you have to stop? No, but it was kind of like a big, like warning thing. Like, oh my God. Yeah. Like I have a problem. I mean, at that point, like my Coke dealer had been like showing up randomly in my apartment and I thought like, Hmm, that's, that's, that's <laughs> kind of shady. Like that's probably a problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I knew I had a party girl reputation. Like when I went to Fox, I was told that, well, you have a party girl reputation. Like, and I was coming from L.A. to New York, so how did those people in New York know about that? <laughs> what happened with, with the when you drank again? So you stopped drinking for nine months and just oh uh, yeah. So yeah. Well, so with World Poker Tour, we got to travel a lot. So like two months in, I went to Paris to shoot there, and I drank there and like had the worst hangover for days. And then I just didn't tell anyone when I came back to the U.S. And then when we were in the Bahamas at month nine. Um, the same person who kind of like convinced me to drink in Paris convinced me to drink there. And I mean, I remember it's at this time I had to shoot a couple episodes um, in the Bahamas after drinking. And I mean, I, you can't, I just can't have one. It like ends up being an all night thing. And I was so hungover during those shows. Like it was just, it was just awful. So I bring that up. I like to talk about that when I, you know, speak and stuff because, I know what it's like to stop drinking for two months and then to, you know, have a night out. And then also after another seven months to have a night out. I mean, it's just, it's like the, it's just amplifying the hangover. Like it's just so bad <laughs> when you do stop. And so I, I've had experience with clearly like not being able to just have one drink. Like it's just not enough. I, I just can't do it. And I don't even know what the point is. Cause why have, why have the calories if you're just going to have one? <laughs> <laughs> like I drank to get drunk. <laughs> when you talk about like stopping drinking cold turkey and, you know, cause I always think like, man, I wish people would just try it out, like try out sobriety or try out a program. Describe the difference right. between th those two things. Oh, you mean just being dry and cold turkey and then being in a program? Yeah. Well, and look, I mean, I don't know if you talk about, do you talk about AA? Cause yeah. Like, yeah. I mean, I did. Like that's touchy. That's, look, with, I am not, here's, 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 here's what I say, Courtney. Like, I am not a representative of Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, and if it comes up, I just say it saved my life. I'm, I'm not a representative, but in, in, in my experience, here's how it worked. Yeah. I mean, I have an issue with the fact that we're not supposed to talk about it. I mean, I'm not going to tell anyone else's, you know, break anyone else's anonymity, but like, I think nowadays with the internet and everything, I feel like we should be able to promote, not promote, but attract <laughs> what worked for us, right? Like if we really want to help and be of service, like we should be able to share that, that, that worked for me. And so you, I think everyone should do the 12 steps and it's about dissecting your life and being able to look back at where you were wrong and clean up your side of the street and continue to do that in every situation and, you know, kind of take inventory on like, Oh, where was, where was I bad today? Where could I be better? And of course, meditation and helping others and um, just knowing that like, it's not all about you in this world. And there is a higher power, whether with God or the universe or the doorknob or AA as a group, like that something else can, you know, help you because you, you clearly don't, you know, can't do it on your own. I've kind of been looking into like Al-Anon, like for, I feel like for like control, like if you have like control issues or like no other alcoholics or people's behavior that you like, if you're upset about, like that's like an outlet on issue where you're supposed to um, kind of be like, Hey, stay out of, stay out of everyone else's hula hoop. Like you do you, you can't control what anyone else does. So just work on you.
Yeah, I just heard Sharon Stone was on a, a podcast because she's got a book coming up, and she talked about – she was very – you could tell she was just centered, you know, and she was right sized. And then she talked about the 12 steps and how she incorporated them in her life. She said, I'm not an addict. She said, but I've come across them through work in Al Anon and it changed my life. And it's kind of the same thing you're talking about. Anybody could use these steps. I mean, I needed them bad, but anybody can use them. Yeah. I really wish that everyone would do them. <laughs> I really <wish. laughs> Totally. Um, well, so I want to get towards the end of your drinking. You know, your career is taking off. I mean, you, you, I know this just from being a, a news person. So you're like one man banding, like an MMJ, which is like you're, you're in, in, right in Jackson, Mississippi, which is like basically you go out, you shoot. Oh, no, no, no. It wasn't, I wish it was Jackson, Mississippi, because that would have been a bigger market. It was Jackson, Tennessee, which I didn't even know existed. I've been, yeah, I understand that feeling. Yeah. <laughs> it was like market 183, which I wanted to start at the bottom. I wanted to work my way up. And yeah, I won man band. I mean, that was the only year of my career I had to do that for the most part. And I was, look, I was really lucky. Like I got to go to Fox News when I was 26. I was the youngest person they hired on air. I mean, I was completely unprepared for it. I had done some local news and the entertainment programming stuff, but I always say I should have done KTLA where I work now. I should have done KTLA before I went to Fox. I mean, I can't change my journey now, but um, I think that like, you know, and I dealt, I dealt with bullying there too. So it was like the At bullying Fox? thing was like, yeah. Cause like the older women, like they're, they did not like the fact that I was getting so much airtime and they were mean to me and, you know, I was experiencing success at a, at a younger age. So, and everybody there partied. I mean, I partied with so many people there in New York. Like that just took my level, my addiction to a whole new level because it, before when I had lived in LA, like we had to drive places. We didn't have Uber or Lyft and there really weren't taxis. So then coming to New York and like seeing that bars are open till 4 a.m. and you can take taxis places. Like that was like, wow, the kid <laughs> in the candy store. And then also like, you know, I was working the morning shift, so I needed, you know, I got a, a, a I guess a, a psychiatrist who, like, just get, you pay them in cash because they don't take insurance, and they're like, oh, here's some Adderall, and here's some Ambien, and here's some Xanax, and then I couldn't go anywhere without a bottle of Xanax on me because I felt like, what if I have a panic attack, like, under, in the subway, if the subway goes down, you know, it was just all this, like, all these chemicals that weren't necessary, and, and when I stopped all that, when I got sober, like, it's just amazing the level of like calm. Like I used to not be able to fly anywhere. I'd have to, I'd have to be drunk to fly or I'd have to have Xanax to fly. And now like I barely even notice we're taking off. And that, that is just like a gift from God yeah. that that has happened. But it's, it's really amazing. I mean, I, I just love being sober. I love the calmness, not having drama and um, it's all the sayings are true that you hear in AA that you, you know, you, live the, the wildest dream or what does it say? Yeah, your your life life beyond life your wildest or, dreams. Or, like, yes, yes, yes. Yes, that. Like all of those things are true. The more time that you get, it just, you know, it's, it's a one day at a time thing. And when you build, you start building up time, you're like, oh wait, I'm like a badass because I've been living life on life terms throughout all this stuff. Like I got through a divorce. I got through moving across the country and changing jobs and, and all these, the headaches and the health things. And just like, just, it's so great that I've been able to do it sober. And now it's become such a thing that I cherish. And that's why I was open about it when I was um, six years sober. That's when I like came out about it publicly on my social media and stuff. Like people in my life knew, but I was like, I'm going to share this. I felt like I had enough like credibility at the time to do that. And, and then I was very well received and I got so many questions about it that I was like, well, I need to just write a book so that I have it all in one place so that I can be like, here, read my book. Cause I can't answer, yeah. you know, I can't answer the questions in a, in a 140 character tweet or an Instagram post. I just don't have the time to do that. So the book I wrote to help, help people i mean that was the whole intention and by the and way now you, hopefully it's going to be turned into a movie I, by the way i heard that i was about to bring that up so in august this is getting option for a movie about your life based on this book is that what's happened yes and the first draft of the script is like 
do any day. And so I've already read the treatment for it. I mean, I have good people who are really interested in doing it. Now, I also know Hollywood takes forever. Yeah. (laughs) We'll see if it actually gets made. I mean, the next step will be them having to like get an actress and a director on board and studio and all that. So cross your fingers that somebody wants to pick it up and it, and it gets made because the whole intention is to is to help people. Yeah, and my fingers are crossed. And, and your husband kicks ass, by the way, because you told me last <laughs> night when we were messaging, I mentioned I used to work in basketball in the NBA, and he's doing the HBO. He's writing the HBO uh, show, which is based on reality yeah. about the Lakers. Annie had an earache on a Saturday of all days. So her mom brought her to Minute Clinic at CVS, where you can see a provider, fill a prescription, and grab essentials like pain relief products, all in one visit. Even on evenings and weekends, you can even see us online with telehealth options. For quality, affordable care on your schedule, visit Minute Clinic at CVS. That's how healthier happens together. Services vary by location. Prescriptions can be obtained at pharmacy of choice. Visit MinuteClinic.com for details. Hi, I'm Hank. You might remember me from a show called King of the Hill. Check out Ma, a King of the Hill rewatch podcast. These boys ain't rap, but they are funny. Find the Ma podcast anywhere you get your podcasts or at roguemedianetwork.com. I tell you what. (laughs) Yeah, it pretty much came to fruition because of, of him. And, but that was like a six year process to, to get that into shooting. So now they're, they're shooting that and he has 20 years. Well, he'll have 20 years sober, um, in October. So we, we met at an AA meeting and, uh, yeah, that's, it's so great being in a sober relationship as well. But, but before that, I mean, I got divorced at year five and Uh, I also, what was that like going through that sober with, with, with two Uh kids? I mean, I mean, look, like for two years, all I did was cry. I mean, I was a mess. I mean, I, and, and we, we don't like feelings as alcoholics. So I had, that's when I learned how to meditate and did all these like self-help things like, oh, let's go trapezing or let's do yoga with goats or whatnot. Like, but I mean, I knew at that point that being sober, of course, like I had to continue on with that. It wasn't, it's not like I was like wanting to drink, but I was wanting to escape the pain of that because it was the death of a 12 year relationship. It was the death of like the family unit and it was just being able to grieve that, but then also trying to date in LA while sober. Oh my goodness. Cause a lot of people have issues out there and you hold a mirror up to them when you are sober unintentionally, of course, but they recognize their problems by seeing you and how you have your shit together. So, um, yeah, I mean, so for four years I did the whole dating thing in, in LA and look, was it nerve wracking to some start? Some people didn't want to date me because I was sober. I mean, and you can tell, right? Like they may not come right out and say it, but you're like, Oh, this person is a little, you know, sheepish about the fact. Right. That so in my book, it. I have, a, in my book, I have a whole chapter on sober dating and kind of like what to look out for. Like there's me, you know, there's, tons of red flags that you can just look for. I mean, I had to learn them all, of course. So part of the book, part <laughs> of no. the, part of the book is you get sober and I don't want to keep you here forever, but I want to kind of just go through this. You get sober in 2009. You start at Fox News in 2007. So somewhere along that 2-year run, you're bottoming out. What, what what's happening? Right. Well, one of I mean, like I said the celebrities had died, so I was thinking about it. One of like the profound moments was that I was coming back from a party in the Hamptons where I'd been doing like coke all day and drinking vodka Red Bulls and I had like blueberry pie smashed on my face for whatever reason cuz I was wasted. And then I was coming back on the train with my friends and I decided to well, it was time to take my Ambien and Ad- and and Xanax cuz I just was constantly popping pills and I put my strapless bra on my head like I was a a pageant winner and my friend which I didn't remember was like interviewing me about winning the pageant and she was filming it and you know there's all these people on there on the train and I remember thinking like oh I'm so cool you know I must be recognized whatever well so she sent me the video like two weeks later and what I saw in that video I was 
appalled at because the people on the train were like very disgusted with my behavior. And I was just like slurring and flopping all over the place and snorting. Like my, you know, I, I was disgusting. It was, it was awful. And so I remember thinking like, okay, this is going to have to wrap up soon. And then two weeks later I was down in Florida with, um, uh, you know, a couple couples and I was like fighting with my then husband. And so I took a bunch of pills and they couldn't wake me up. Like I was passed out and they couldn't wake me up. And so they came up when I woke up that morning, they came up to the bed and surrounded the bed and just all said different things that made me decide in that moment to go to rehab. And I knew, I mean, I was so like hung over and like my brain was like spinning, but I knew like, okay, if I do this, it'll be the best thing for myself. And then also like, I do have more to offer this world and I have more to, you know, I, I deserve this for myself. So I'm really glad that I had those thoughts in that moment. You know, I, I and you're vulnerable enough and cool enough uh, that, that that video, uh, I, I just doing like, you know, my due diligence as a guy who wants to get this right as a news guy. That video is on, on, on the web of you on the bus. I mean, there's, oh, yeah. there's pictures. No, so I went at the Fox in Philly. I did an interview to promote my book, and I aired some of that on there. Yeah, and people, yeah, you can yeah, find I it. Didn't, and, and I didn't, it's funny, I didn't watch that until I had nine years sober, because that's when I was starting to, like, I was writing the book then, and I had someone kind of helping me, and we watched it together, and she actually laughed at it. I mean, looking at it now, like, it's like, I mean, thank God I had the reaction that I had to it then because that was such a defining moment. And you can <laughs> laugh now because you're sober. I mean, it is right. kind of funny because yeah. you're sober. If you weren't and you were dead or, or you know, you were in prison, then it wouldn't be. But it is. And that's one of the cool things about the book, too, because I I got the audio book, which, by the way, you read, which is awesome. And yes. it, it, there's a lot of there's a lot of laughs because the fact is, if you get sober, you can look back on this stuff and, you know, it's pretty funny. Some of yeah. it. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Like if I was still using and talking about how I used to get Coke for my drug dealer and get straight A's and all that, like that wouldn't be very smart of me. No. <laughs> to be talking about that. So your career's taken but the re- off. I mean, look, the reason I'm public about it is to help others as are you. Like, no. Yeah. And people but, know that, but I, I promise, like, I promise, like, there's a quote that's like, I wish I never got sober, said nobody ever. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. It's it's very true. And, and and somebody like you, too, I'm telling you, you paved the way for other people to come out. Even now talking to you, you're so transparent and you're so open about it. And there's a strength and a power that comes with that that I think is really cool for people to see. And I hope people are listening to this and they see like, you know, you mentioned the fact that you were shy and bullied as, as a kid. So you drink to overcome that. And now in sobriety with the program. You're living life like a loose shirt. It's empowering. Uh-huh. Yeah, you just have to remember, like, I couldn't go anywhere without drinking. Like, I would drink before going to church. I would drink before going to the movies. I would drink before going to, like, softball practice. Like, I, I would drink before everything. And now I don't have to drink before anything, and I don't even want to. It's the last thing I would want to do. I want to be present, and I want to remember those things and have real connections with people and and it's also so freeing because I'm sure you know, Pete, like you can just go to the party, you know, show up for the, the person's birthday or book signing or whatnot and hang out for an hour or two, like talk to people and then be like, all right, I'm over this. I'm leaving. Yeah. You know, whereas before you'd be like causing all this trouble and being up all night until the, the birds are chirping and feeling like crap the next day and it was a vicious cycle that would just keep going and going and there is a better way so part of your better way starts you go to rehab right and then after that you get out you get out of rehab and you start to go to a lot of meetings i'm assuming and i did what they told me to do there you go. Um, the, the rehab i went to was very a based um i was kind of like legally blonde goes to rehab like and straight a like student goes to rehab like taking notes sitting at the front of class going into the real going to town where the real people meetings were i was like okay if i'm doing this i'm doing it but i also thought i was only going to do it for a year i was like i'll do this for a year oh really so you thought i'm just going to not drink for a year yeah i was like oh that'll be enough time and um i went to like outpatient um stuff for three months after and got a commitment at, at 
did the 90 and 90 and all that stuff and got a sponsor and worked the steps. And, and then at, at, um, eight months sober, I found out I was pregnant with my son. So really my, my children, like I have a different path than, than, you know, a person who is maybe single in their, you know, at 25 or, or whatnot, like, I, you know, I, that's, that's different. But for me, like my kids, they helped me get through those early years of sobriety because I was in it with them and, you know, I wasn't going to wake up hungover and like them need me. Like, I can't think of a worse thing than being hungover and having kids be like, mommy, mommy, mommy. Like that just sounds awful. And you're, le- you're learning. So how I've, been, you- I've been a hundred percent present for them. So they're nine and 10 now. And they, they know all about mommy and their stepdad's like, um, sobriety. And they, they, they know when like we sell it celebrate each year with the cakes and stuff like that we do cakes out here i don't know if you guys do that yeah yeah, yeah. well I, I know the california thing because my brother's involved out there and I, it's pretty awesome the birthday stuff so real quick you can't overrate the fact that you go through a divorce sober you have a child sober uh and and i gotta believe you know and also by the way you, you go back to work at fox which is like not the most like cohesive environment i'm guessing at that time um there's a lot there's a lot happening and you're staying sober and you're not, you're not drinking. I mean, that's like, that's a lot. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you read, if you read the book, it's like, it's like story. My husband read it and he was like, Oh my God. Like the whole thing is like story after story. It's yeah. like this shit you've been through. But I look, the, the two worst weeks of my life were the first week of like, going to rehab and dealing with that and like knowing my life was changing. And then the first week of my divorce was like, there are two weeks I never ever want to redo, but I am so grateful for both of those experiences because they forced me to do the work on myself and so much came out of it health wise and like evolved life. So uh, it's, it's, it's weird how, how that works. It's so, it's so true when we say like, you know, people's bottoms end up being like the most, the, their blessings. Yeah. And how did you flex that muscle after you, you get that blessing? And I can tell you start to do like esteemable things, which help you build confidence. Did you just continue to build off that? Yeah. I, I mean, I'm, con- I'm constantly a work in progress and I love it. Like in the past two years my thing is like journaling so like if I have some frustrated with someone I immediately set my phone timer for 20 minutes and I just allow myself to write everything about it like all my feelings like in every in or in a situation like what's the worst case scenario that could come out of this like what what is what have I learned from this what was my part in it and all of that so that's a helpful tool and then I meditate for at least 20 minutes every day I might miss like one or two days a month or something, but that's a very helpful tool for me. And that keeps me sane and calm. I mean, that's a whole chapter in my book too. Just like the meditation 101. Like, cause I was, I was like, Oh hell no, I am not doing that. I have, I have major ADD. Like I am not paying a babysitter to go sit on a floor where I'm not burning calories. <laughs> I had no interest in, in meditation and then I started doing it and then all these things were changing in my life. And then I became like addicted to that where I, I just need it. My body needs it. Your body needs a meditation. It needs a recovery. Are you still plugged into meetings? Yeah. Yeah. I actually, all of COVID have been hosting one on my, my house has like a rooftop. So I've been having like on average, like 15 people over every week. Don't, don't call the, 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 the COVID <laughs> cops on oh. me. It, we were outside. Oh wait, but you're, you're in another state. We're a little crazy. Yeah, I'm in another here. state. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm in Texas. It's a lot different, but I know again, through my brother who's out there, who's sober out there in Hermosa. And he was, he, you know, he didn't like zoom and he didn't get on zoom and for not for a while. Right. And he wasn't going in person. And, and uh, I think he would tell you, he was wound pretty tight for a little bit. Yeah, so I love Zoom and it's great. I I've, I've been able to speak at so many meetings because of it. Like I don't, you know, cuz when you have two little kids, like it's it's harder to make commitments to go places and with the traffic in LA and then having to get a sitter and all of that stuff. So for me to just be like, "Hey kids, be on your iPad for an hour. Uh, I got to speak at this meeting." And then be done in an hour. Like it's it's 
I, I think it's the best thing ever. And you can go to meetings like all over. I went to like a meeting in Australia and stuff. Like it's so cool. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. I mean, it really is. Again, it's just such I hope, an I hope, I hope Zoom AA meetings stay forever. I, I think it's great for people who are, you know, are scared to walk into an actual meeting. Like they don't even have to turn their cameras on if they don't want to. They can just like listen to the message um, from from their computer. It's so great. And then I, but I think like there were always AA speeches and stuff online. It's, you just have to be willing to do the work. It's, it's, sadly, like, or I mean, the good thing is if you do it, but like people always are like, how do I do it? Or my daughter has a problem or whatever. So then I said, I say, go to Al-Anon or, you know, there's no excuse. Oh, we don't have money for rehab. There's no excuse. Like go to three meetings a day. Like that's your rehab. Like they're free. You can do that. But a lot of people don't want to do the work. So you do have to do some, have to do some work and you, I'm still doing work. Did you ever compare yourself out? When you went to, did you go to meetings when you said, you know, I'm not like these people? Um, no, I, 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 I realized very quickly that I had a commonality with all of them, even though we weren't like physically similar or like job status similar or whatnot. Like I was like, wait, I have more in common with these people than like other people like in at my work or what, whatnot. I mean, I, I, I was just kind of told like, take, take what you like from this. You know, that, that's, I just, I mean, I was, I, I'm so blessed I went to rehab. Like, I always tell people, like, okay, if you can, go. Because yeah. here's the deal. The consequences, like, with work knowing and everything, like, I don't know if I would have gotten sober if I didn't go to rehab for me. I don't think I would have. Because I needed, I needed, like, the stakes to be that high. And also I needed the 28 days to like get in the rhythm of that. Like, yeah. and I needed, I needed that structure. I needed, I needed rehab to be so bad that I never wanted to go through that again. You know, like, um, like that was traumatizing and very vulnerable for me to be there. Like it, it was awful. <laughs> Yeah, it, it was an intense. I don't ever want to go there again. <laughs> That's it's intense. I went to a treatment, and like I love how you said you started to listen to what people you started to do what people told you to do. I went to mm -hmm. rehab, and I was pretty screwed up. So I, I went to like an ex extended care, quote unquote, you know, air quotes halfway house or, or or air quotes extended care. It was like a halfway house for four months, and that's why I marvel at you going through all that stuff. Uh, at Fox because and just being like a raw nerve all that's happening around you because I was I was literally like in a halfway house surrounded by meetings and recovery and it really helped me out like for the long term sobriety like model worked for me a guy told me hey it's right. a couple months for the rest of your life and it's kind of like what you're saying about rehab if you can choose go and I think that even if you don't have insurance there's places I mean they may not be as she she and and my rehab was was it was a nice place, but it was not like, oh, drink green juice and go horseback riding and get massages and do yoga. Like, no, it was legit, like from 7 a.m. till 10 at night, act, you know, activities, group meetings, like AA meetings, everything. Like it was, it was, <laughs> it was work. Was it weird for you to go to rehab as like a celebrity? Um... I mean, I wasn't like, I was like a news celebrity. We're not, there was, there was like a, a big time celebrity in there with me. So okay. the attention was, was, was there okay. on, on that person in, instead. How, how, I, I don't know. I just, I just felt like that was just such, like, I, I'm telling you that first week was the worst week and my divorce, like it was just like out of body experiences, like of, of, of feelings you've never felt before. And. I'm glad I journaled about it because so my chapter three is all about my rehab experience. How did you get through? I mean, again, people should read the book. How did you get through that first week? Because you could have left if you wanted to. Well, I knew, no, see, here's the deal. I knew that it was costing a lot of money and I'm very frugal. So if I'm paying for something, I'm way more committed. So <laughs> what the strength to open up? What, where did you, where did you find that? Where did you get that? Because that's a huge deal. Oh, coming out about it? Yeah. You mean? I mean, coming out, you know, six years sober, you come out about it. And, and again, people that, people that watch the news know, you know, people see you or, or a news personality as like a buttoned up individual that they can trust. And so there's got to be right. a, a voice in the back of your mind that's saying, wait, if you do this, you know, you're putting everything on the line. 
look, there were people like my great aunt who's 95 years old. She had a major problem with it. But uh, hello, times have changed. I just, I'm just super very like authentic and, and it was something that I was the most proud about in my life. So why, why am I going to hide that? And if there's a chance to help other people, that's, that's why I put it out there. And, and look, by doing so, I mean, I, I technically gave myself a, a, like a lot more work by being out about it because then everyone asks you to speak and everybody, you know, wants you to, wants your help and, and all that. So like if someone comes out about it, like you should be like, wow, that's awesome that you're willing to help other people about it because you're going to. When you came out, there was the thing about President Trump and people should read the book, former President Trump. What was it like to get like attention for that? Because, you know, you put this book out to help people and then people take a sliver right. of it and they throw it out there. It's got to you had to be like, what the heck? Yeah, look. We'll just leave the whole writing of the book, publishing the book. That whole, that was a disaster. <laughs> I mean, I'm glad that the book came out and I'm glad that it's going to be, a, you know, hopefully a movie that, that will, and, and it's helping people. Like, I just have to remember that, that it's helping people, but like, oh my gosh, that whole world, like when you're not familiar with like the world of publishing and everything, there are people who will take advantage of you and con you. And I was extorted for my rights for my book. I mean, it was, it was crazy. And then everything, nothing went to plan on that. But look, now I'm glad that at least it came out when it did because I got to have some book parties and media exposure, like go around the country and do interviews on news stations and everything before COVID happened. It was January 2020, right? When it came out? Yes. Yes. I wanted it to come out in January because of like New Year, New You, and also Dry January. Was that crazy to go around the country to talk about it? I didn't. I mean, I had like maybe five. I did like San Diego, New York, Philly, and Florida, um, and then I I did like radio interviews and 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 things, web things here and there. But it ultimately, actually, the promotion of the book was cut off with COVID. Like I had some book signings in other cities and everything and that was all canceled so my hope is that it will be like revived again if there is a movie yeah because like that again and i i mean that's what that was it wasn't about me trust me i wasn't trying to get famous or make money off my book and that definitely neither of those things happened. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right so last, last question was, before i let you go what were you gonna say i stopped you no i, I don't know i i'm I'm rambling at this point. <laughs> yeah, that's the best. That's the best of your read. Let's get let's get to what you tell people. I clearly, I'm sure a lot of people ask you to maybe walk them through the steps or or or, or lean on you, especially when you meet young women in meetings. What do you tell them? People that have doubts about getting sober, people that just aren't sure, people that are on the debate squad. Right. Well, first of all, I usually give them a link to my book and I'm like, read this <laughs> because <laughs> it is literally like the ABCs of like w how it was, what I did, what it's like now, what you can do to, to get help. Um, I, I use the fun thing is, is a pretty pro popular thing about like, oh my God, I never, I thought I was never going to have fun again. And like, I promise you, like, I'm always like, I I'm so grateful that this came into my life. Like I didn't plan to have this journey and I thank God so much. Like I'm, I'm so, I'm so grateful. I have so much gratitude that I'm sober. Like all these amazing, I think people just see like all these amazing blessings in my life. I'm like, that's because I got sober. That happened because I got sober. And, and that's the message I try to promote, like, on my, on my social media, too, is that, like, hey, look, I'm, I'm, you know, dancing at a club, and I'm sober, and I'm having fun. Or, like, hey, look, I'm doing this, like, serene thing that I never would have thought was fun before, and now, like, I'm loving this. And people are like, oh, hey, I want that, too. Do you have moments when you're like, I can't believe I'm doing X sober? Not X to X, is it, but, like, I can't believe I'm doing this, and I'm sober? Um, not really, but I also, there, I, look, I'm not going to sign up to go on a, on a, like a day excursion on a yacht with a bunch of drunk people. Like that just doesn't sound fun to me. If, if it was like, okay, we're going to sail around for an hour and come back. Then of course, like I would do that. Like, oh, a sunset, sunset booze cruise, like for two hours. Like I could do that. 
but I just, I don't want to be around like people are getting wasted and obnoxious. Like, and I have, my day has like, is really busy. Like I have a lot, a lot of things to do. So I don't need to commit to a day hanging out with people drinking all day. <laughs> Before we let you get back to your busy day, anything else you got? I mean, wh- where's your Instagram and, st- and, and uh, where can people find you on Instagram? Oh yeah. Everything on social is just at Courtney Friel. My okay. book's on Amazon. It's also on Audible as well. And, and just put out good intentions that it, it does get made into a movie so that it will help more people. Cause that was, that was the whole intention for the book. Like I like to, I feel like this book's great for like, if you know someone who's going to rehab, that's, that's kind of like, this would be a great book to read in rehab. And, and look, you're the real deal. I mean, this is, you're, you're not sitting down talking to Joe Rogan here. You, you, you took an hour out of your day to talk to another sober person about helping somebody else. And that is right there, the proof being in the pudding. So I really appreciate you taking the time. Oh, well, it was, I mean, I love talking about being sober. I don't know if it's always coming out as articulately as I would like to, because anytime I hear these things, I'm like, oh my God, I sound like such a valley girl. Oh. That's awesome. <laughs> Do you do a lot of speaking? <laughs> I well, this year it's all been on Zoom stuff, but I do panels and things. I mean, anytime people ask me to speak, I for the most part do, unless it's like six o'clock in the morning or you know, if I'm anchoring, it's like, sorry, I have to go to work. Yeah, and you're you're KTLA now. Yeah, I've been there eight years. They've been cool about me being out about it. I I think times are changing. Yeah. cool to be sober and, and people like lots of celebrities are sober now and talking about it and healthy lifestyle, especially out in California. I mean, there's lots of people who just don't even drink because of they're vegans or something. I do feel like we're moving in the right direction. Look, I, I'll let you go. I appreciate you so much taking the time, Courtney, really. Thank you so much. And this will be, this will be up uh, this Thursday. So I'll, I'll shoot you. Um, I'll shoot it to you if you want to listen. All right. Okay. Well, thanks. It was, it was nice to meet you yeah. for the podcast. Yeah, I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Courtney. And if you're if you're in LA visiting your brother, let me know. All right, you got it. I'm actually gonna. I'm not gonna do this to you, but I'm actually gonna be there a couple weeks from now. He's going. He, we're staying at Terranea. Um, oh, cool. Yeah, because he plays music there a lot. He's a therapist out there. Ke- Kevin Souza is his name. So he, <laughs> he's big in the sober community. He's big in the therapist community. So he's a, he's a good guy. Well, I mean, hit me up because I have the meeting here. So you never know. Maybe you're in town for it. All right. Thanks, Courtney. I appreciate it. All right. Well, have a good day. All right. You too. Thank you so much. Okay. Bye. All right. Bye-bye. Thanks so much for listening to The Payoff with Pete. Once again, I'm Pete Souza, And of course, we are part of the Rogue Media Network. All kinds of good podcasts you can find at roguemedianetwork.com. And of course, you can find this podcast and all those other ones wherever you get your podcasts, iTunes, Spotify, other spots like that. This has been a Rogue Media Podcast. And I'm Mike. And we have a fantastic new podcast to tell you about. Bros, Foes, and Heroes. It's the two of us looking into the world of comics, breaking down some characters that you may have never heard of, and some that are just absolutely ridiculous. Yeah, so Zach comes up with a character each time, and uh, I go into it just completely blind. I don't know who this person is or what their abilities are or anything, and and basically I guess we kind of go over their origin story and just some of the ridiculous stuff that maybe especially Golden Age stuff. Oh, Golden yeah. Age stuff is always the best, and we will make sure to highlight all of the shenanigans and just absolute weirdness yeah. of everything. Yeah, that's right. So subscribe today and uh, follow us on Instagram at Bros Bros Heroes. And if you don't, I know where you live. Not really, but please subscribe. <laughs> bros and Bros and Heroes. Gonna tell you about pros and foes and heroes. Gonna tell you about. Ah.
I'm Hank. You might remember me from a show called King of the Hill. Check out Ma, a King of the Hill rewatch podcast. These boys ain't rap, but they are funny. Find the Ma podcast anywhere you get your podcasts or at roguemedianetwork.com. I tell you what. <laughs> hmm.